My name is John Lynch, I'm the Director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies and welcome to this which I'm fairly sure will be the last of the ANCLA seminars for the year and today we have a very up to the minute, very thin presentation about Brazil. I'm not going to say anything about the presentation or about Brazil because I think some background is going to be done by our two speakers today. Just let me introduce them. First of all, we have my colleague, uh, Dr. Sean Burgess. Sean is a recent appointment to the ANU in the field of Latin American politics, and he has the distinction of being the first appointment in Latin American politics at an Australian university ever. Uh, and so this is quite a uh, <laughs> first And indeed, he's going to be teaching next semester uh, foundation course on the introduction to Latin American politics and society, we, which we expect to have 200 or more students. So it's a very important addition to our ANCLUS team here at the ANU. Uh, his specialty is Brazil, and in fact Brazilian foreign policy. Uh, his last book was Brazilian foreign policy after the Cold War. Since the Cold War? After the Cold War. Uh, the second speaker is Patrick uh, Cavallo, who is uh, here, studying at the ANU as a PhD student now, but has already had a very extensive career in Brazil and elsewhere. He's picked up, I think, two master's degrees along the way. Uh, he's doing a PhD in economics. And his particular, the expertise I think he particularly brings to the seminar here today is that, although a young man, he was the head of economic analysis in the Rio de Janeiro Federation of Industrial Enterprises, which is a very important position uh, given the importance of that federation and the importance of development of industry in Brazil. I think we've got time for about uh, 45 or so minutes of presentation and then discussion and questions. Two other things about ANCLUS seminars that you need to know. You always get asked to put your name down on an ANCLUS uh, contact list if you haven't already because in the last two years, I think this is the 35th <coughs> seminar we've had over the two year, last two year period, and we've shown about 36 films and three, had three international conferences, many, many other cultural events. So if you're on that list, you get invited to the wall. You're all free, you're all no RSVP, and you're welcome to come. So make sure you're on the list, allegedly. Uh, and afterwards, the second thing about ANCLA seminars is that uh, some of the most important parts of the discussion after the seminar actually finishes, and for that purpose, we have professionals line and Middles and so on afterwards, and we invited you to stay around and continue the discussion. For, without further ado, just one other thing: so we can, we'll turn the camera off once the presentation's done. So if you're worried about being heard, nobody else will know. <laughs> <laughs> you will be able to see eventually when we solve a few technical problems. You will be able to see these videos of all the seminars on the web uh, via the Empress website. We've got some working now, but eventually everything will be a video and audio file. Um, but, as Sean said, after that, people can speak more freely and they don't go down on the web uh, with that opinion. So, Sean. Well, I'm going to hand oh, off to Patrick okay. right away. Yeah. Patrick is going to start with the background and uh, set the scene for mm -hmm. where we are right now. My idea is to uh, present a little bit of Brazil, some basic facts, talk about a little bit of economic perspective in Brazil. Our main argument is that Brazil is in, another, is in, a, in a new paradigm. So, and why is it? And what, what, what happens to, to become like this? And from here, we're going to analyze the elections, the outcome of the election. And further, we're going to talk about a little bit of overall defense and foreign policy as well. Okay, so let's get started. So Brazil is a, is a republic. It's a federation of 26 states. Uh, official language is Portuguese. So the last constitution is from 1988. The name of the currency is Rio or Real. The GDP is 1.6 trillion. This year, it might end up as 1.9 trillion dollars. So it's a little bit, uh, roughly, uh, same as um, similar to Australia. The only difference is that Brazil has 200 million people and Australia has 22, 23 million. Uh, the GDP per capita is 8,000 US dollars. Uh, in the beginning of the century, it was around 3,000, 4,000. So it's a big change in Brazil in, this, in the last eight years, and that's what we're going to show now. 
a little bit of the, about the population. Uh, the gender distribution is roughly about uh, men and women, 50-50. Uh, about the racial composition, 48% is self-proclaimed white. So just a little bit of cultural background here. Uh, I'm considered white in Brazil, although maybe in the United States or even in Australia. 50% uh, self-proclaimed um, black or mulatto. Mulatto is a little bit of folkloric uh, um, miscegenation mis mis uh, between black and white people, so it, it's called mulatto. So 50% 50, 50 is uh, in this uh, area, and around 1% is all others, indigenous, uh, Asians. Well, about the age demographic, this is very important. Brazil is still a very young country. As you see, 64% is adult, and only 10% over 60 years old. And one part is about the children, up to 14 years old. So it's, it's a good uh, component for the, for the perspective for the new coming years in terms of uh, GDP growth. The population growth rate is 1% a year, so it's uh, rather stabilized. It's getting a little bit lower year by year. But the idea that we, in Brazil, we don't have a problem of aging population or shrinking population yet. So it's something that it will happen in the last 30 years. Uh, the huge development index 0 0.8 is an escape from 0 to 1. It's already considered a developed country by the United Nations, according to the HDI. Uh, and the Gini coefficient, which is a coefficient for inequality, is considered is 0 0.5. It's the Gini coefficient uh, goes from zero to one, and the higher, the more unequal. So Brazil is still uh, very unequal compared to international standards, especially to developing countries, developed countries. But the the good thing is that the, the trend is that's going down, which is becoming less unequal. We're going to show this a little bit later. So the main exports and destinations of Brazil. This is the the, the, the summary for the last year. So Brazil has a very diversified uh, composition of uh, goods, although 6% is uh, uh, composed of commodities. We see that 11% uh, soybeans, 10% transport material, uh, cars and, and parts, 10% uh, oil, and basically mainly produce, 80% is produced in Rio. So the main uh, produ production of oil in Brazil is, is from Rio de Janeiro. Or 9.4%. Mainly iron ore and other other ores, uh, meat, uh, metallurgic products, chemicals. But we also have uh, machines, uh, coffee, electric equipment, and even um, airplanes. So it's very it's diversified, in special, not only in, in goods but also in technological uh, components. Uh, if you look to the destination, it's very interesting that now China is the the biggest recipient of Brazilian exports accounting for 13% of total. Uh, in the beginning of the century, the United States was heading the, the, the list with 25%, and now it's only 10%. Is that, that's not that the United States uh, is importing less Brazilian goods, but actually that China uh, is starting to import a lot of Brazilian goods, especially ore, uh, iron ore, soybeans, and oil. And we'll see that uh, Brazilian exports have increased more than triple in the last uh, eight years, eight, nine years. So there's a change of paradigm here uh, from Brazilian economy. And there are, we, we, are, we analyze this uh, change of paradigm based on these three topics. The first is the, the real plan that was implemented in 1994 that with Fernando Henrique Cardoso that completely uh, exterminated uh, hyperinflation in Brazil. Uh, just in 1992, for example, the inflation was over 2,000% a year. And with the real plan, since then, the inflation has been lower than 20-10%, which is for Brazilian standards very low. So the, the second point is the macroeconomic stability tripod. So the three pillars of Brazilian uh, change of paradigm. The first one is inflation targeting. Since 1999, Brazil has been uh, pursuing inflation according to the inflation target uh, tools, which means that the central bank has an explicit inflation target and it ch changed inter interest rates accordingly to promote a stable economy. Uh, second pillar is the flexible exchange rate. 
1999 with the devaluation of Rio at the time uh, due to the Russian crisis and Brazil had a, a big problem, big crisis at the time. The fixed exchange rate uh, came to, uh, to become the flexible one and since then Brazil is committed to a flexible exchange rate which is very good in the long term. The last pillar is called the Fiscal Responsibility Act. It's one of the main things that changed in Brazil. In the recent time, Brazil had always had a problem with public debt, especially external public debt. And with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, we're going to see that uh, Brazil was able to contain the increase in, the, in, the, in, the, in its debt. And the third one uh, is the China effect. Uh, all, it's, I, I would say that without the, these three, that wouldn't be possible to have what, the change of paradigm that we have today and the, how the China effect it, came into power. The thing is that with, when China started to become a, a huge global player since 2003, the price of commodities have, have, has, have, the price of commodities has increased more than five times since then. And since Brazil exports 6 percent of its, of its exports are commodities, it was a huge uh, terms of, of trade impact, shock, positive shock in terms of trade, in terms of uh, terms of trade that was able to Brazil not only to expand ex exports but completely uh, um, eliminate its external vulnerability in terms of external uh, external debt. Uh, since 2007, Brazil has become a net ex net creditor, net external creditor, which means that. It has more dollars in its central bank than it owns in loans outside Brazilian liabilities. So here is a inflation targeting uh, process. Since 1999, we can see that inflation has, this is a target, 4.5%. Okay. So since, I like that. So since uh, uh, 1999, the inflation target has been stabilized at 4.5% with 2% band. Of range to 6.5 and 3 and 2.5, and since the year since 2005, the inflation has has uh, stabilized in those uh, range in in, these, in the in the range between 2.5 and 6.5. About from fiscal responsibility, uh, Brazil has uh, this this act that uh, implemented said that Brazil has to target a certain what, it, what is called a primary result which excludes the payment of loans or interest rates. So it's the endogenous uh, component of the of fiscal, uh, fiscal responsibility. So it has consistently... <laughs> okay. So it has consistently uh, pursued uh, at around 3% of surplus of fiscal fiscal surplus since uh, 1999 and with this in red line it shows the nominal result which is the budget result that we uh, use here in Australia and elsewhere uh, which means that Brazil has increasingly uh, de actually diminishing its deficit in nominal result in the budget deficit since uh, since then and the uh, forecast is that in 2011-2012 for the first time in history Brazil will have a positive nominal result for budget for the government budget, which is something really important to, uh, in a way, reduce even more the public debt. And here is the, the, the picture of the public debt. Since, uh, if we look at here, in 2002, uh, the public debt was around 60% of GDP, which, if we look, if you compare this, uh, these numbers with some developed countries, it's not very alarming, but the problem, the thing is that in Brazil, the composition of the public debt is very uh, short term, so it's even harder to, to roll the, the debt in a sense. So Brazil has tried to, uh, since then, reduce its public debt and has been successfully doing it. Uh, and the idea is that by 2014, we're going to talk about it a little later, uh, the target is to be around 30%, which is very, very positive in terms of history, Brazilian history. Another uh, side effect of uh, more exports and more FDI coming to Brazil is the extensive accumulation of international reserves. If we look here in Brazil, from 1998 to 2002, the, the Brazil had uh, roughly 30 billion US dollars in, in the central bank as foreign reserves, and this year is going to end up with around 300 billion, so increase 10 times. And we see in, in 
green, the green part of the Brazilian International Reserve were actually loans from the IMF. And in 2004, Brazil completely paid back all the loans from IMF. And not only that, in 2005 and 2006, it started to lend to the IMF. So it became a creditor of the IMF, which is something, again, uh, never happened before. And as we see here, Brazil since 2007 became a net external debt creditor, which means that it has more dollars in the central bank than in, li in external liabilities, in dollars. And the external debt was always a uh, uh, kill hills in the Brazilian history. Uh, PT, which is the Lula's party, when the, the beginning 1990s, always said that we shouldn't pay the, the external debt. And ironically, with PT in power and looming power, they were the ones that actually were able to convert the, the scenario, and now it became a net external creditor. So here comes the change of paradigm. So what happens with the, all these numbers? What 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 what, uh, what do these numbers mean? So here we have the old dynamics. And every time uh, there was an external crisis, either in Asia, Russia, United States, whenever, whatever. <coughs> There is a devaluation of Brazilian currency. Why? Because Brazil is an emerging country. So it's a risky asset. It's a risky country. So whenever you have an external crisis, people become, become more averse, risk averse. So the Brazilian currency devaluates. That's, that's a normal thing. But then, before 2003, uh, most of the Brazilian debt was dollarized. And because the, the, the Brazilian currency became cheaper, which means that you need more dollars to buy, uh, less dollars to buy Brazilian currency, there was a, immediately a debt explosion, just because all the Brazil, most of the Brazilian debt was in dollars. So since the dollar became more expensive, there was a debt explosion. With, an, with a debt explosion, there was a, a pass-through effect through imports, that the price of imports became more expensive because the dollar was more expensive in terms of real, in terms of Brazilian currency. So not only a debt explosion, but we also had inflation problem. And that's what you saw in the beginning of 2000, what happened when Brazil, when we had the dot-com crisis. Well, since you have debt explosion and inflation, unavoidably, uh, you have a fiscal and monetary contraction, which means the government is obliged to increase interest rates, a fiscal one, and a monetary one, to, and, a, and it's obliged to stop spending, a fiscal contraction. So in the old, old, old dynamics, whenever we had an external crisis, the government was obliged to increase interest rates and lower expanding, which means recession. So that's why I, in Brazil we call the hands flies build business cycle. It was, a, it was originally a term to try to synthesize the Brazilian uh, attempt to grow. So every time it started to take a flight and growing, came down because of devaluation. So it was called the hand fight business cycle. But now the current dynamics, and I think the, since 2003 is the, the, the mark, the landmark of, uh, of the change. There is, whenever we have an external crisis, we still have devaluation. Brazil still is a, a emerging country, so it's a risky asset. But now Brazil is a net external cred debt creditor, which means that it has more, more dollars he, in, in, inside the Brazilian central bank than liabilities, which means that Whenever there is a devaluation of the Brazilian currency, Brazilian government gets richer, which is a contrast sense, but it's true, just because of the fact. And not only that, the, because of the inflation target is so successful, the inflation expectations are anchored. So the economic agents, they believe in the Brazilian Central Bank now, so the, the pass-through effect is very diminished, very mitigated, in the sense that for the first time in history, as Lula always says, uh, Brazil had an external crisis, not only they had an external crisis, the biggest external crisis since 1929, which is the GFC, the Global Financial Crisis right now, and for the first time, the Brazilian government was able not only to decrease interest rates, but also increase spending, which means fiscal and monetary expansion. So it put a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, fire into the economy, a lot of, of stimulus into the economy, which Brazil for the first time it had an external crisis, a big external crisis, but only uh, suffered a short slowdown, not even a recession, just a slowdown. It did just 
a, a lower acceleration. So here is a, a, a picture of the new Brazilian economy. In 2002, when Lula got into power in the, at the end of 2002, the GDP growth was 2.7%. Now he's rendering the GDP growth rate to Jill Tilma as 7.5%. If we look at the inflation, inflation was double the inflation right now, it's 5.5%. Right now, it was 12.5% at that. International reserves, around 40% in 2002, including the IMF loans. Now with no IMF loans, we, got, we, we have 285 US billion dollars in the central bank, Brazilian central bank. Exports from 60 billion to almost 200 billion. Exchange rate, in, uh, appreciated a lot, so from 3.5 for one US dollar to 1.7 reals to one US dollars. The budget deficit decreased, even with the, with the fiscal stimulus that is being implemented, from minus 4.5 to minus 1.5%. Public debt from 61% to 40%. The stock market, we see that was 10,000 points in 2002. Now it's 71,000 points, which means that if you have 100, 100 uh, Brazilian currency, 100 reals, invested in the U uh, Brazilian stock market in 2002, now you would have $710, 710 uh, reals. Not only that, if we take into account that the Brazilian currency has a, uh, increasingly, has immensely appreciated in the period in US dollar terms, it, it means a much bigger uh, investment. And, and Okay, and the benchmark interest rate, which is the Australian cash rate. With Brazil, always had a, a big problem with cash rates with a benchmark interest rate. And we see that at that time, in 2002, it was 25%. Now it's over 11%, which is the lowest uh, level in history. Now, let's take a look. Uh, the, since we've, we've finished a little bit now about the, the economy, we start, let's just take a look at the, the job market, about like how is social things going in Brazil. We see that job, job market has completely changed as well. Not only growth has come, but jobs were created. We see that in the past eight years, which are the eight years of Lula's government, uh, we have, uh, Brazil had 14 million jobs created. That's formal jobs, formal boosts, and never, ha never happened before. If you look, the eight years be before 2003, we see a PFS, a very, very negligible Increase in the, the since 1995 to 1999, 2000 a little bit more, but then increased. But since then, since 2001, 2002, the increase has uh, been 14 million, and that's a, a huge problem because Brazil has a, a lot of uh, problem with job with jobless rate, and we'll see that uh, probably Sean will talk about it. The Dilma, her, one of her promises is that in the her next four years is to double that, so increase uh, uh, more 14 million in the next eight years. So let's see if she can do it. Well, not only jobs were created, but the purchasing power of salaries, of wages, has been increasing. Here we, we look at the real minimum wage, and real in, in the sense that it's discounted inflation. Now it's 510 reals, Brazilian currency. Uh, which is the highest level since 1990s, actually since it was created, uh, since the, 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 the democratiza democratization of Brazil. And next year is going to be 540, which a little bit of real, uh, real gains in the increase. Which means that if you have more jobs and you have a bigger uh, purchasing power, you have actually an expansion of the maximum consumption. So if you have uh, more jobs and a bigger and uh, ex more ex purchasing power, you have an expansion of the maximum consumption. And we see in blue is the middle income class. and has increased from 42% to 53% in the past since 2002. This is just for the Lula's period. And uh, in red is the lower level income class. So it has decreased from 30% to 18%, almost halved. 
And because of that, we see that there was an extensive reduction in inequality. It's still high for international development standards. It's much above the United States, which is not a, a, like considered the most equal country in the world, but still above it. But the trend since 2000, actually since 1996, it's been decreasing, and has the, the decrease has been more st uh, steep since uh, 2005. So it, uh, the world, uh, the current world price, the GFC, the global financial price, the grand test of Brazilian economy in this in its new paradigm. And we see that Brazil now has a strong economic fundamental, which reduce immensely the impact of the of the GFC of the world crisis and that the elements of the global financial crisis, the GFC, were not present in the Brazilian economy. Brazil had no responsible expansion of credit. On the opposite, Brazil has a very incipient, although rising, uh, expansion of credit. Brazil, there, there is no housing bubble in Brazil. On the opposite, Brazil actually has a huge uh, housing deficit, and we're going to tackle this later. And there was no high leverage of financial and banking system. And why? Because of the, the scenario was so uh, unpredictable in Brazil in, the, in previous times, and the interest rate was so high, uh, the banks and financial system in general were much more averse and much more less ever much less ever uh, leveraged than international standards. And here are the numbers for that. If we see the healthy banking system, Brazil, in terms of the bank capital adequacy according to the Basel Index, which means that how, how much money you, have to, you need to have in, in, in the house in, order to, in terms of loans, Brazil has more than double the international standards. And actually, the, the minimum uh, regulated by the central bank is 11%, and the actual one is 17%, which means that Brazilian banks are very less leveraged, uh, very low, uh, Brazilian banks have very low leverage of capital. If we look to the, the part of credit portfolio of the banking system, it's very balanced between state, private, and state, private, and foreign banks. So here in Brazil, if we look at China, for example, it's almost 90% public banks. So in Brazil, it's very balanced, counting a little bit for the state, around 50% for private domestic banks for 40% and 10% for foreign. And that's not because Brazil has a, a, a small size of banking system. Actually, Brazil has three uh, banks in the top 20 ranking of the largest banks in the world. We see the first one is Saúde Bank, which is a private bank. Second by Bradesco, which is another private Brazilian private bank. And the third one is the Bank do Brazil, which is a public, uh, public bank from a national bank. As, we, as I said, uh, the, the, the credit is only 49% of GDP. is very low to compare to uh, other countries. As you see, the United States, for example, has in terms of loans of credit, 187% of, of, of credit in terms of its GDP. And all other countries here in Brazil has only 49%. And it has doubled in the past five, six years. So it's, it's increasing a lot, but it's still a, a lot to increase, a lot of room to increase. And uh, there is a prospective housing market. If we look to the mortgage credit, Brazil has only 3% of its GDP in mortgage, which is very low. Compared to Australia, for example, has, Australia has 84% of its GDP in mortgage, which is a good thing. Everybody wants to own their own house. The problem that in Brazil was so, the, the economic scenario was so unpredictable, interest rates were so high that nobody would be able to actually get a mortgage or even crazy to get a mortgage. It was better to first accumulate wealth and then buy a house than to actually take a loan, a mortgage to buy a house. And that's why one of the things that is one of the big markets in Brazil in the next 10 years. Not only because there is a huge demand, but the supply is very low. And here's a country housing deficit in Brazil is 8 million units. And just to a little bit of the size of it, uh, this numbers here is the numbers of contracts of units in, in, the, in the housing market in Brazil has been very low since 1974, a little bit peak in 1979 to 84, but then since Lula in 2003 has doubled in the past two, in the past two years to 560,000, but it still has 8 million units of deficit, so it's a lot to grow. So my advice, if anyone has a little bit of spare money and wants to invest in Brazil, look at the housing market 
which is the thing. And another thing that we're going to talk about is uh, Brazil has a huge, weak infrastructure, and it has to invest a lot in this subject, in this topic, and it's doing its, its homework in the sense. Uh, for the next four years, uh, major investment were announced were around 700 billion US dollars, so it's half of GDP of Brazilian, well, a third of the Brazilian GDP. And if you look here, yeah, uh, most of the some of the G of the of the investments announced. For example, the bullet train between Rio and São Paulo, some of uh, the railways and highways, the river interchange in, in the northeast, of several uh, big investment uh, ventures. So, having said that, Brazil was always said to be the country of the future, and we say that the future has arrived, in a sense. And why? Well, Brazil now has sound macroeconomic fundamentals. Low inflation, unprecedented low level interest rates, mass uh, consumption class rising right now, low unemployment, higher salaries, better terms of trade in terms of uh, price of exports, a strong and flexible currency, positive fiscal budgets, it has, it's a net external creditor, it's a big recipient of FDI, foreign direct investments, has a sovereign and transparent financial and banking system, and <clears throat> as an investment grade since uh, last year. Not only that, Brazil has a young and large population, of, as opposed to uh, Russia, for example, another BRIC. Has a stable, non-violent democracy, big natural, yes, big natural reserves, including water basins. Pre-salt oil, which is, has been just discovered in the last two years, and it's about, we say that it's a uh, new Saudi Arabia just under the sea. So it's around 300 kilometers off the coast, seven kilometers down Saudi Arabia. They are off in terms of oil. <laughs> so the production will start uh, in the next four years. So it's something that would uh, turn Brazil into the biggest exporter, oil exporter in the world. The 2014 World Cup, 2016 <laughs> Olympics, it's, it's not a coincidence. It's actually to crown Brazil uh, as a big, as a national, as a global economic player as the 2008 Beijing was for China. There's a, a high, high housing deficit, which is a good market, and an increasing levels of investment macro and micro level. And here, yeah, a little bit. So here we talk about the political scenario now. So just talk about economics, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to yeah, please. No. Okay. So there was just an election in Brazil, and uh, it was an interesting campaign to watch. Um, it was probably my, very much the kind that uh, some politician in Australia maybe wish they could have had, but never will. Where you had Lula walking around with his arm around Dilma, as you saw in the picture for this uh, advertising this talk, saying, vote for her. Dilma still, uh, Lula still has 87% popularity. People were saying quite publicly, I'll vote for whoever Lula tells me to. I don't care. I like him, I trust him, I'll do what he says. And then we see the results with this. In the end, uh, it still went to a second round. Dilma picked up 56% of the vote. Jose Serra, who's uh, got a long, long history of politics in Brazil, set up most of the health system that's running now under Cardoso. He came out with 44%. So the PSDB, de Bé, the Party for Social Democracy in Brazil, is sort of now lost, not sure what to do. The Workers' Party thinks it has it all sorted out, except for one problem. What do they do when Lula goes? When Lula's fates in the scene. So, as I said, Dilma, she's Lula's appointee. Um, she's never been elected to a post before. This is her first electoral victory. She's been in the PT for a long time. She was a Marxist rebel, political prisoner. Um, there's some question about what exactly went on back then, but either way, she protested against what was going on in the dictatorship. Served as the Ministry, Minister of Energy for a while. During that time period, also banged heads quite severely with Sergio Gabrielli, who's the head of Petrobras. Petrobras is, I think, the eighth, second largest company in the world now by capitalization. If I've got my numbers right. Enormous, huge multinational oil company. Also state control. I'll get to that in a minute. She was also Lula's chief of staff, which is why he chose her. He knew how she thinks. She knows what she does. Um, very technocratic individual. Very competent manager from what we've heard. I've been told incredibly difficult to work with. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for those of you coming from government here, who at the very high level isn't in some, some sense of the word? <laughs> um, okay, by... Uh, 
parties, you look at the electoral results with the governors. Governors are important. They control their own budgets. They dictate a lot of what goes on. One of the big dynamics in Brazilian politics is between the state governors, the mayors, and the presidency, so trying to figure out who gets money for what and how it gets divided. Now, what we find here is almost as back as a slaughter. The PSD Bay got killed. They lost a lot of governorships. The PT picked up a few. The PT coalition, the PT works quite closely with the PMD Bay, which is the uh, Democratic Movement of Brazil. Party for the Democratic Movement of Brazil. Um, the Dem lost out really badly in the set of elections. Um, so what do we wind up with here? Lower House of Congress, which is, um, you're all familiar with the United States Congress, and that if you want to get anything through Congress, it's really going to be a pain. It's possibly worse in Brazil, because due to some quirks with the structure of the political system and list voting, there's even less party loyalty, so you can't really hold that tag of I'll pull you off the list because they'll say, I don't care, I'm just going to go for another office or I'll switch party. Um, so there's an awful lot of that goes on. So very, very important to be able to create a functional block. And this is what we see happening here, is that the Red Coalition, which is the PT, has now got enough, the 60%, in theory it has enough to get a constitutional amendment through, which could be very important for, for Dilma's agenda. The opposition has shrunk massively. Uh, the independents, again, kind of a marginal voice. Most of them, a good chunk of them, will vote with the pay, uh, the PT anyways. Now, the interesting dynamic in this, the PMD is crucially important for uh, the PT to keep its uh, its coalition alive in Congress. Now, there's a war going on for who gets what ministerial seats. So the PMD is saying, if you want us to support you, we need to be given some power. What ministries are we going to get? We want seven, and we want seven. And even though Guido, uh, Guido Mantega counts. Or was it the PMD Meirelles joined the PMD. So he's gone, so it doesn't matter. Um, we want seven of them. And if you're not going to give us the seven of them, we're going to create a super block, and we're going to block everything you do. So the last week and a half, we've seen the PMD leadership running around, creating this coalition of 202 seats, uh, which is separate from the PT, which means they can either say to the PT, you get what you want, or you don't get what you want. Now, how long that will be able to last, is another question which we'll get to when we talk to some of the personalities involved in this. Um, so as you're saying, big shifts in the composition of Congress. Uh, it creates a lot of potential. I think this is probably the first time since 1988 that there's been a coalition strong enough to shift yes, the Constitution. Yeah. This is, a, you know, tax reform system is a mess. Um, linkage of pension, uh, the pension programs to the minimum wages is a big problem. All of these are things that Repeated presidents have tried to change and haven't been able to do because they didn't have the support of Congress. Notionally, Dilma could pursue this sort of thing. One of them is a new tax that she's trying to put into increased tax revenue in a more equitable or, or widely distributed manner. Senate, we see much the same thing playing out again. Um, shift of power roughly towards the PT. Um, so it should allow the PT to do what it wants to do. Um, whether Dilma could pull this off and manage it. Whether she can pull it off and, and manage the, the personal dynamics is another question. So a coalition stayed steady. The opposition has dropped. Uh, this again is the, the PSD Bay have dropped. Part of this comes down to personalities. Uh, José Serra was the front man for um, the PSD Bay. He was the presidential candidate. Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who was the previous president of the PSD Bay, is a very uh, patrician individual. But he's one of these people you hear speak and you respect. Even if you're poor and you're uneducated, you look at him and go, no, I can trust you, your grandfatherly kind of figure. Santa doesn't give off the same kind of vibe. Same kind of person, but comes across as a little bit more mean-spirited. And then when you put that up against Lula, then you have a recipe for total disaster. And Lula spent the entire campaign trying to give his version of history, saying that everything was a disaster in July arrived. Dilma will continue. More of the same vote for Dilma. And the results shows. It shows in the results. So what does Dilma have to deal with when she gets in there? She has an oversized and convoluted tax system. And as Patrick can tell you in great depth, probably, uh, business in Brazil, let alone individuals, has a horrendous time with the tax system. Um, you have a distorted labor market. Now, Patrick's been showing the data about big improvements in the number of formal jobs. The reality is there's an awful lot of employment remains informal. The added twist that comes from the tax system is there's no incentive to formalize your informal appointment. 
if you talk to some of the people at the uh, industrial federations, they'll tell you that small and medium enterprises, or the potential small and medium enterprises, don't want to incorporate because of the tax problems. Small and medium enterprises can't get loans from the banks because every single one of them is in tax court because they haven't filed the taxes properly. It's not that they didn't want to, it's they couldn't figure out how. Uh, so you need to have teams of 100 people to figure out how to fill out the tax form. So it, it just becomes very difficult. Judicial system bureaucracy, extremely slow. They are everywhere, but they're worse than Brazil. Um, infrastructure is a critical problem. Um, Patrick's colleagues at Fiesta, which is the Sao Paulo Federation for Industrial Enterprises, have told me flat out, if you can fix the tax system and if you can fix our infrastructure problems, we will compete with anybody in the world. We'll go free trade, globally, unilaterally opening, like Chile. Uh, is that the problem we have is the combination of infrastructure and taxes means that we're facing right away about a 30% ta implicit tax in our production. So anything we produce costs 30% more because of the administrative burdens and the logistical burdens. Uh, environmental issues. Now, of course, the Amazon is all the things that we talk about the most, but the big one, and this is, you've repeatedly made this point, you're right, is the subsoil. They're drilling for oil. It's just offshore. It's just right there. Reach out and get it. It's 7,000 meters down. It's 4,000 meters of ocean, and then it's 3,000 meters of rock. And the catch with the rock is that salt layer in the middle, which is supposed to be incredibly difficult to drill through. So what happens if you have a couple of repeats of what went on in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Brazil? This could be very, you know, it could be very, very bad. It could be massive uh, implications. Okay, this gives you a sense of the tax burden, too. This is one of the big problems that we have in Brazil. Um, as some of my friends at the Brazilian universities like to say, there's one thing our country is extremely good at, it's taxing people. 38% of GDP is the tax rate. That's what they're taking in, which is enormously high compared to any other developing country or country, emerging market country. 38% of GDP puts it on a par of the country I'm from, Canada. And I can tell you the service level is very different in the two countries. So it's okay to pay that kind of percentage of your GDP in taxes if you're getting the same service. In Brazil, you don't. Again, red tape. It's expensive. Hernando de Soto told us this. Looking at Peru and Brazil, you see it every day. It's just cheaper to do things informally if you're a small business. It's just too expensive. Um, all right, so now we get to sort of the, uh, the dark stuff. <laughs> because we have all these problems. Dilma has to solve them. She has the potential to solve them. How is she going to do it? All right, now this first guy here, Jose Toseo, really important guy, guy to know about. There was a scandal. Uh, Lula's a bit like a Teflon Don. Nothing sticks to him. Nothing bad, anyways. There was a big scandal in about 2005 called the Mensa Lao scandal. And what had emerged is that Lula's presidency was paying people in Congress, paying them cash to vote in a particular matter, a uh, particular direction on bills so they could get their legislation through Congress. So, you know, you can ask questions about pork barreling, delivering, you know, as we see in the United States, or as we're going to see a lot of here, of MPs receiving particular projects in order to vote in a particular way. But this was cash in a bag under the table. Uh, Derseo ran the project. Derseo is also one of the intellectual architects of the, uh, the Pete project in general. He's been with Lula and with uh, the gentleman next to him, Marco Aurelio Garcia, for, for decades. Derseo uh, was engaged in terrorist resistance, or not terrorist, but armed resistance against military dictatorship, um, was expelled from Brazil, went to Cuba, was trained by Cuban intelligence, purportedly has had uh, cosmetic surgery. So when you talk about backroom mechanics on how to manipulate things, how to make people go, how to make deals happen, how to find ways to get people to do what you want them to, you, he's, you're not going to find a better person to learn from. He was expelled from Congress over the Mensa Lao, and he vanished from sight, but he was still behind the scenes. He was one of the people purportedly running shuttle diplomacy with Evo Morales in Bolivia and Hugo Chavez in, in Caracas, and also going back and forth to Cuba which is why you saw a big change in how the discourse in Latin America kind of calmed down about 2006 as Dorsale started to run around in the circle to keep everybody in place. Marco Aurelio Garcia, another guy who was exiled during the dictatorship, uh, spent quite a bit of time in Cuba. Charming man, um, but he's a political animal. He will do exactly what he needs to do to get his agenda forward. Um, he uh, emerged as we had a sort of shift in the foreign policy framework in Brazil under Lula. You had basically three foreign ministers. You had Celso Amorim, who we all know is the current foreign minister. You had uh, Samuel Pinheiro Guimarães, who was the Secretary General, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, then became the Minister for Strategic, uh, 
strategic affairs, I guess. And they had uh, Marco Aurelio. And he basically ran a South American project. This idea that South America needs to come together, which builds on stuff Cardoso had been doing, and keeps it going forward. He also was a key part of uh, Dillon's campaign because he coordinated the formation of the platform, the consultations, uh, the discussions of what will happen. Both of these two guys seem to be still in the picture, particularly Dersayo. Dersayo has come out and said that the election of Dilma is more important than the election of Lula. Because with Dilma we can finish what we started with Lula. And more to the point, with Dilma we don't have to worry about the personal charisma getting in the way of doing the things we need to do. Um, I think the sense I got from these comments he had in the press last week was that Lula would say no to some things. And they couldn't do what they wanted to do because he said no. And they seem to think that maybe Dilma won't say no. I think that might be a little bit optimistic. But everybody's a little bit high because they just won the election. So, <laughs> yeah. Samuel um, Pinheiro Guimarães on the left, um, career diplomat, was sent into internal exile by Fernando Hiki Cardoso for vocally opposing the free trade area of the Americas, staunch nationalist. All of this rhetoric and these ideas that you hear of Southern solidarity that have been coming out of Brazil, South-South linkages, is coming out of Santo Pinheiro. The idea that we should be using national industries, industrial giants, to push forward Brazilian development, is coming out of Santo Pinheiro. So a very key organic intellectual type person inside the, the whole Dilma Lula Pete framework. Um, not too sure if he's going to still be in the picture. My guess is you might find him floating around somewhere, and even if it's not in the presidency or around there. It'll be somehow feeding ideas in. Now, the next guy, Antonio Palacci, this guy is definitely in the picture, and he's one of the most important indicators that we have of what's going on. Palacci was uh, Lula's first finance minister, and he got tied up in the Mensalau scandal. There was also uh, a problem with how contractors were paid or what they did afterwards in uh, Ribeiro Preto, where he was mayor. Uh, so he essentially had to resign in a you know, cloud of corruption. He's back. Uh, ran the Dilma campaign, and he's going to be apparently the Secretary General of the Presidency. Dilma's reframing a little bit how the, uh, the system works in Brazil. Um, the Chief of Staff, which was her job, is going to get downgraded a little bit. It's going to become much more administrative. Um, the Secretary General is going to be really quite important and have a lot of power. Palachi looks like he's going to be charged with managing relations with the governors and managing relations with the mayors. This becomes very important in meeting the fiscal targets. How do you maintain their expectations, keep them in place, explain what needs to be done. The benefit of Palachi is that Palachi is a former finance minister, and he was a good one. So he can have a very technocratic discussion with people who perhaps are trying to play politics. And there's a good history in Brazil of using technocratic language to achieve political goals. So we may well see quite a bit more of that. All right, this is how up to date we were. Um, this team got announced yesterday. <laughs> Um, Guido Manteca is staying at finance. Everybody's delighted about this because they trust him. Uh, he spoke at the G20 and apparently everybody stopped and listened. Uh, he's continuing on, so steady hand there should be no problems. Alexandre Trombini is going to be the new head of the central bank, president of the central bank. Um, so in 2002, when Lula was coming into power, Cardoso was saying, no problems, everything will be okay. Uh, the entire global marketplace in the West, in the North, tried to take a run at the Brazilian currency. It got to 3.99 reals to the dollar. They tried to undercut the credibility of everything that was going on in Brazil. They didn't trust anyone who was coming in. Uh, Henrique Meirelles uh, was appointed. No, he's Brazilian. We can't trust him. The manager has been running First Bank Boston. You know, very experienced, serious banker. The same thing's going on with Fomini right now. This is the guy who came up with the inflation targeting, has been managing the inflation targeting. He's one of seven directors of the central bank. He spent his entire career at the central bank. Um, he's quite committed because, frankly, he could have walked out of the central bank and probably be making 10 to 20 million a year easily right now. Pedro Milan, a former head of the central bank, just sold his investment fund in Goldman Sachs for, I think it was 700 million. So these guys in the central bank can make a serious point. Important point with Brazilian policy is that you can pretty much bet that inflation targeting is going to stay in place. This matters because Dilma said that she wants to bring the real interest rate in Brazil down to 2%. So the, her comment is that the industrialized world, the major industrialized economies, have a real interest rate of 2%. So that's whatever the bank rate is minus inflation. Right now in Brazil, it's about 4.5%, 5%. She wants to get it down to 2 There's a couple of ways you do that. One is you can uh, increase the money supply, like we're seeing in the US, which creates inflation. That's a bad thing. It's hard to stop. 
The other thing you can do is you can cut spending. She's not going to cut spending. <laughs> she can't. Because that would mean she has to cut social programs. That would be the end of her support. So the fact that Trombini is there means that there's going to be a bit of a break on things. We don't need to worry too much. Miriam Belchior, um, she ran PAC, the uh, accelerated, uh, Program of Accelerated Growth is what it was called. Essentially, it's a $700 billion pot of money to build infrastructure. So all the stimulus packages that we talked about during the global financial crisis, uh, Brazil had actually started three years earlier, four years earlier, and she was the one who was managing it. She's now been moved to planning ministry and charged with improving government efficiency, delivering more programming without increasing spending, which is probably going to be a big part of bringing the uh, GDP down to, uh, debt to GDP ratio down to 30%. Now, Luciano Coutinho, this is one name that probably almost nobody knows outside of Brazil, and he's one of the most powerful men in the country. He runs the, the National Bank for Economic and Social Development, the BNDES. Last year it dispersed over $90 billion. It disperses more money than all the multilateral development banks combined. So he has enormous power. And this money very frequently is used to direct Brazilian industrial policy in a particular direction. So this brings us to some of the key things that Dilma works with. Um, notionally, three of these are private or semi-private companies, the three of the big ones I've picked up on, uh, just to give you a sense of what goes on. Petrobras, biggest company, one of the biggest oil companies in the world, biggest companies in the world, period. Um, it's being manipulated by the government to drive national development. Now this is not necessarily a bad thing, but the clear decision has been made that if you want to be involved in the subsalt uh, activities, contracting with Petrobras, you need to be building your product in Brazil. You need to be doing your research in Brazil. You need to be doing something that builds Brazil's industrial capacity. Vale, same thing. Vale is a private company. Now, the government has a golden share in Vale. Uh, as, well, I guess Australians know Vale very well because it competes with Rio Tinto and BHP. Um, the golden share simply means the corporate headquarters have to stay in Brazil. That's all it can do. But through the, the, uh, the Bain and the they can very much manipulate what goes on. This has happened a bit to Valley and very much to another guy named Ike Batista, who is a huge, uh, multi, one of the richest men in the world, mining, oil, and so on. If you don't play the game with the Brazilian government and try and help along with the industrial policy that they want to do, you lose access to the, the, uh, the financing through the development bank. And that's very cheap financing. It's globally competitive rates. So you find that Valley is now uh, refining iron ore into steel in Brazil. It didn't particularly want to, but it's doing it. Uh, Petrobras and Valley are both sourcing uh, ocean-going ships out of Brazil instead of having them made in a cheaper location. A part of how this all works, government's got a big share of it. Pension funds are very important with these big Brazilian companies. They own massive chunks of it. Um, Valley Power owns the majority of Valley. And Valley Power, in turn, is owned largely by, by national, uh, federal level pension funds. Policy. So there's a lot of stuff going on here too, and this is continuing on from Lula. Um, again, industrial policy, and this is what you will see continuing all the way through the Lula government. She's going to continue to push any area of national policy in some shape or form to develop the Brazilian economy and its technical capacity. So what do we have coming in? Uh, first one, supersonic jets, apparently, maybe. Uh, they've been talking about this for 10 years. So Boeing, forget it, that's not going to happen. Uh, they're not going to buy Boeing jets because Boeing in the United States won't allow the technology transfer. They've already blocked the sale of uh, Brazilian Super Tucano uh, training jets to Venezuelans because of uh, technolo technological components in the plane. So now the competition is between Dassault and between Saab. Um, I don't know which way to go, probably slightly more to Dassault because the plane actually exists. The attraction with Saab is that the plane doesn't exist. So the Brazilians would build the plane from the ground up with Saab. So that would be entail an enormous inflow of knowledge on avionics and uh, aerospace industry. Even with the Dassault project, they're going to get quite a bit. Nuclear submarine fleets being built. Right? But this seems like an absolutely ridiculous idea. I mean, why is Brazil's got no ambitions to project force. So you start to think about the subsoil, which is all off the coast of Brazil, but a little bit too far off the coast. It's not actually all in Brazilian territorial waters. So how can you patrol and protect? Um, there's also the technical element. To look at six nuclear subs, that's going to be about three and a half billion euros. And then you have everything else that adds on top of this. This is an enormous program. With that comes all of the technology, all of the know-how. Um, is Brazil going to build a nuclear bomb? This is a question I've been asked quite a few times. They can't. 
Um, and I remember talking to one senior diplomat saying, you know, no, we're not going to build one. They went, yet. Now, the Constitution forbids the use of nuclear energy for anything but specific uses, which means you can't build a bomb. It doesn't mean you can't do what some a country like Canada or Australia can do, which is have the capacity to build one almost at the drop of the hat if you want, which might be a much more realistic direction where you'll see them go. And finally, they have a new defense policy from 2008. The whole principle behind the defense policy is to integrate all of South America inwards towards Brazil. Stop. It's okay. Is to uh, pull up attention in. So they're looking at interoperability of defense systems, using similar guns, similar planes, similar communication systems. This talk about the South American Defense Council. So it's all thinking who's the regional hegemon, who's the regional leader, who's the regional coordinator. It's going to be Brazil not the United States. They're trying to actually start to provide some sort of security goods, but they're also trying to make everybody else pay for it. Uh, this is sort of a long-term a long tradition of Brazil. So foreign policy, what are we going to see happen with foreign policy writ large? Um, little of substance is going to change, uh, mostly because you're going to have the same general figures in place. Uh, Sassuwa Marim is going to, he's going, he said he's done, so I think, I think he's probably tired, he's been there for eight years. Looks like Antonio Patriota is going to take over. An immensely impressive man, very bright, very articulate, very quick mind. Basically, a younger version of Amorim or a younger version of uh, La Prea. It's a, Brazil generally has about a dozen people of this caliber ready to go to the job at any time. Um, one of the things he'll be pushing hard is a continued engagement with Africa. Brazil's been very clever about this. They've used development cooperation, which I'll talk about in a bit, and just straightforward, plain talking as equals across the table to get into Africa. Now, Cardoso didn't want to bother. Initially, Itamaraty, the Brazilian foreign ministry, didn't want to bother at the beginning of the Lula years. The drivers for this, and this is new in Brazilian foreign policy, were the construction companies and the mining companies. So Vale, and Roberto Lourdes, OAS, and Draghi Gutierrez. Because they saw that there was an enormous amount of business could be made. One of the things that got done to, to make this fly is they rewrote the rules of the National Development Bank for export financing so you could ex finance the export of services meaning engineering. So you now see the in enhanced political engagement uh, with Africa, and if you hang out around the foreign ministry in Brazil, you see an African delegation come in at least twice a week from one country or another. Um, and they're picking up contracts. They're taking the construction contracts with Chinese. They're pulling the mining contracts away from the Canadians, the Chinese, um, and the Australians. And they're doing this because, partly because of an attitude that we're here for the long haul, and we're also here with you as a partner, as an equal, not as uh, a dominating factor. So the story they tell is that things are going great. China said the same thing 10 years ago, so I mean, we'll see what happens. Um, but this is a hallmark of what's going on with Brazil, particularly in South America. There's a keen awareness that whatever they do, they need to bring the regional partners with them. And the way they describe this is to draw a comparison with the United States. So if you think about the border problems the U.S. has with Mexico and the inequality between the two countries, that's a relatively easy uh, line to patrol and to manage when you compare it to Brazil's. Brazil borders 10 countries, most of it through the Amazon, in places that you can't get to. So they're pretty clear that if we can't bring Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, um, and the, Serb the Guyanas with us, how do we know these people aren't going to flow across the borders? They already have big issues with uh, a very poorly, a badly treated Bolivian diaspora in Sao Paulo. So they're trying to do things to address that now. Uh, in terms of things that Australia needs to worry about or think about, um, Brazil wants to be at the major decision-making tables and they're going to force the way in there. They will do what they need to do to get there. The big one, the one they haven't figured out how to pull off yet, is security. They tried with Iran, it went really badly. They've been oddly silent in the whole Costa Rica and Nicaragua uh, problem that's going on right now. Uh, but they're looking, how can we project force or be some sort of a security force? Um, you might see more adventures along the lines of Haiti when they start to take on a role in, uh, in uh, peacekeeping of some kind or other. Okay. Bigger things we have coming in. Um, last 16 years, you've had a dominance of presidential diplomacy. The foreign minister has been the president for all intents and purposes. Lula or Cardoso, so they've done that. Dilma's not so interested in this. Uh, Dilma has stated she's much more inclined to stay at home and take care of matters at home. This it's important because it means the foreign ministry can start to claw back some of the space that's been losing over the last eight years to other actors within the Brazilian polity. So Itamaraty is going to be a little bit more in control of what's going on because it's not going to have the same pressure coming from the presidential palace to say, 
do this, do this, do this. And the big example of this recently was the whole situation in Iran. The foreign ministry did not want to get involved in that. But they had incredibly strong commands coming from Lula, from Rafaelio, and Samuel Pinheiro saying, you need, we're doing this. We are going to try and broker a deal between, uh, with Iran on nuclear enrichment. And again, Sosman uh, he's going, Macarelio's staying. So, building on this, lots of embassies. Problem is they don't have the staff <laughs> to build them all. They don't necessarily have stuff to do in all these places, but it's forward planning. So if you look at where they're, they're going, they're, they're looking out to where there's new opportunities. There's a bit of an entrepreneurial take. Um, it's also a big widening of engagement. Um, on top of this, you have South-South Economic Cooperation. Uh, Brazil does development assistance effectively. It's really what it is. It's how we would talk about it here. It's not how they talk about it. They talk about it as South-South Cooperation. Now, it, it's, it's a semantic twist, but it's a very important one. It means that we're not doing something to you or for you. We're, doing, we're talking to you and figuring out how we can both do something together. Logic in Brazil is we'll go and do a project in another country and they will benefit, but we're also going to learn something there that we can bring back. And it's found in the model of how they do it. Um, expenditures are roughly about 20 billion at the moment, formerly, by the Brazilian Agency for Cooperation. The way it works, it spends like about 800 billion. Is the ABC makes contact with the other country, they arrange the project, and then what happens is they find the part of the Brazilian bureaucracy that can do that, and they send the people there. So you wind up with things like very successful experimental farms in uh, Ghana and Senegal. You also wind up the creation of an entire public health system in Namibia, which was done with the uh, Fundação Osvaldo, uh, Osvaldo Cruz. This, again, feeds into this building strong relationships, which is then being channeled back to the industrial policy idea to get strong penetration for Brazilian companies. So, and I'm saying this in sort of critical Marxist terms almost, but it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's a different way of engaging with market creation. Um, again, this just gives you a sense of what's going on and where they're targeting. South America is important, but it's the African target that's absolutely astounding. The amount of effort that's going into getting presence in Africa. Um, and Lula, what's he Lula going to do when he goes? Well, one of the things he's saying is maybe continue on with this trend, to try and continue building relations with Africa. Brings us to the question, and also at the end of the talk. What happens in four years' time? Okay. We've been arguing about this for a couple of weeks now, <laughs> because you think Lula's coming back. I think Lula's dead. I think he's done. Um, partly because the media doesn't want to pay any attention. But we had news yesterday. He gave his first ever press conference only for blog writers, and he said that he's going to be blogging and tweeting. So, whatever happens, we're going to hear from him in some shape or form. <laughs>